Hi, my name's Charlie, and today I'll be discussing my development throughout the Vio video module. The first part of this video will compare and contrast the two videos I made this year. The first one, an e-learning video aimed at teaching people photography theory, and the second, a group e-learning video about feminism on Instagram. So first, we'll be using Moon's model of reflection to critically reflect on how my understanding of viral media theory developed throughout the module. Before the module started, I held some misconceptions about virality, thinking that most content online achieve virality simply because of eye-catching thumbnails. Looking back now, I can see that these misconceptions were wrong. So why is that? Well, the moment that particularly helped me understand virality, join the module and see that my misconceptions were just that was my exposure to Neon and Hemsley's definition of virality as a social information flow process. Understanding virality as a process with many factors, internal and external to the video, influencing whether people share it, was crucial when planning out the production of my first video, as I now knew I couldn't just rely on an engaging thumbnail for it to achieve virality, but had to consider factors like its content. I knew I had to apply some bottom-up strategies in my video, with Burgess contagious characteristics proving particularly useful. But upon learning about steps, I had to raise the question, how can I use this theory to improve the virality of an e-learning video? I found that the contagious characteristic particularly applicable to e-learning videos is practical value, as the goal of this genre is to teach people useful information, which encourages sharing, with practical value in an e-learning video based on one, its subject matter, and two, how engaging the content of the video is. The subject matter of my video ensured it had practical value as it covered effect theory, an important yet underrepresented photography theory found in Camera Lucida. Here I applied parts of Kuen and Lingwall's social media plan to ensure my video's virality, undertaking a competitor analysis to see what similar videos were already online. Many videos I found discussed the book, however I couldn't find any that went into this theory in detail. Therefore, I concluded that my video does have practical value, as it offers help to students previously unavailable on video sharing platforms. Secondly, I applied Guartel's findings on how to make educational videos engaging so viewers retain more useful information. I applied Guo's findings that the constant movement of Carl style drawing tutorials are more engaging than static slides for the audience by having constant annotation around stationary photographs. What I believe I could have improved here was through introducing even more movement on screen. For example, using gentle zooms into the photos as I analyse them so as to introduce a constant visual flow across all the frame. However, on the whole at this stage of the module, I found the steps theory to be mostly unapplicable to the e-learning genre. One possible way of improvement could be to open up the story's characteristic so that instead of a video having to teach us a deep moral lesson to increase its virality, which can be difficult in a purely academic clip, virality could be achieved in an e-learning video if it successfully gives us a deep understanding of a previously unknown academic concept. Looking at my second video now, I can see that my knowledge of virality changed over the year, as the second one was more engaging in the way it explained academic concepts, thus improving its practical value. The key moment that was a catalyst for making this change was when I received feedback from my module le leader regarding my first video. Although predominantly positive, it was noted that the overall look and feel of the video was inconsistent, with a lot of variation in style and a more consistent visual style could enhance credibility and engagement. This particular perspective on my video ensured that I knew I had to improve the presentation of my following video in order to make it more engaging. To achieve this, I re-examined Guartel's findings and saw that videos that intersperse an instructor's talking head with slides are more engaging than slides alone. My first video did apply this finding somewhat. But looking back now, I can see that the long stretches of video where my face is not seen could make the viewer less engaged with the content and less likely to share. So using my own initiative, I took Guo's findings to their logical conclusion in my second video and ensured that a talking head is constantly seen throughout, with any animation appearing around the speaker rather than constantly breaking away. This constant connection meant more engagement from viewers, meaning they were taking more useful information, which is needed for a video to achieve practical value. 
When creating my second video, my previously held belief that all of the steps theory, other than practical value, would largely inapplicable to e-learning videos began to slip away. I saw that triggers could be used in an e-learning video, with my second video linking much more to the outside world with its reference to the culturally relevant topics of Instagram and feminism. This link to the everyday was further enhanced by how we finished the video, asking a call to action of the viewer, encourage them to apply what they had learned in the video when they were scrolling through Instagram. A further level of engagement which was missing in my first video. Both my second and first video were similar in that stories were not applicable to them. In fact, we actively avoided any attempt at including deep moral teaching in the second video in fear of it getting too preachy. However, like the first video, I did expand the contagious characteristic by providing a much deeper understanding of an academic concept. But where my second video contrasts to the first one is that it does so by getting people to think about what they have just learned and how it may apply to their own life, rather than just using abstract examples to explain theory. Going forward, I believe I can further develop my skills by utilising different contagious characteristics in other genres of videos. For example, using emotion to achieve virality in promotional content. In the second part of this video, I will use the Gibbs Reflective Cycle to reflect on the development of my teamwork and leadership skills throughout the module. To begin with, my group broke up into two subgroups, both tasked with coming up with ideas for videos based on two different academic papers. Here, I was able to demonstrate one of Goldman's leadership types, participative leadership, forging consensus in my subgroup by ensuring everyone worked on the same task at the same time with communication of paramount importance. Following on from this, both sub-teams came together with plans for two different videos and the task was to decide which one to follow going forward. There was a lot of deliberation at this stage, however I believe I was able to demonstrate visionary leadership by being the catalyst for change by suggesting we go with the other sub-team's idea as I could see that the other group had more contagious characteristics and would be more visually engaging as it focused on Instagram. Also at this point, I thought that it was necessary to provide a clear direction and not waste any more time. Therefore, by the end of this meeting, we were safely in Tuckman's forming stage, as everyone had become orientated to the task and knew exactly what they had to do going forward, and the relationship between group members continued to develop. However, disaster struck just as we came out of the pre-production phase, as one group member had their phone and laptop stolen. This put us firmly in Tuckman's storming stage, by creating intergroup conflict due to the team being unable to progress properly as we couldn't communicate with everyone. Looking at the feeling stage of the reflective cycle now, this impacted our group's experience because we felt as though the team was incomplete and thought we were unable to move forward as a whole. The lack of unity that characterises the storming stage was definitely present here, as the aforementioned group member became slightly marginalised due to them having no contact with the rest of us. If I were to evaluate this experience, I'd say what was bad was that it caused the entire group to lose momentum, as we were left in limbo and couldn't really progress in our work. However, what was good about the experience was that when communication between the whole team was eventually re-established, we were able to enter Tuckman's norming stage, as the incident brought us closer together and helped us develop cohesion. This was largely achieved by my use of affiliative leadership, as we ensured our teammate was okay before continuing with the task, empathising with their situation in an open discussion, which ultimately helped to build relationships between everyone in the group. In analysing this situation, I can now see that it ultimately benefited our group, as the incident forced us to streamline production as we had less time, so we worked more efficiently, and as a team we knew we had the togetherness to overcome difficulties. We were aware the incident didn't go well as we were only using one form of communication at the time, Teams. So we decided to find each other on social media so other ways of communication were accessible. What I personally took from this situation was that, when working with others, you shouldn't always just be completely task focused. Sometimes taking a step back and checking in on your teammates to ensure a motivated and harmonious group is just as important as getting your individual tasks done. Therefore, in conclusion, I believe as a team we could have established secondary communication channels at an earlier stage. However, after team cohesion was built with the help of affiliative leadership, the group entered Goldman's performance stage as we all became extremely flexible in the production stage with everyone doing more than one task simultaneously. For example, I did both filming and editing. 
Moving forward then, I hope to apply what I learned in this project by avoiding any hole in the progress of future group work, making sure this doesn't happen again by creating a secondary plan. For example, by giving team members roles to do in case external circumstances arise and the whole team can't work together. In terms of progress in my own teamwork and leadership skills, I believe it is important to continue to work on adopting more than just one leadership style, with a particular focus on the participative and affiliative styles, so to ensure team members are okay throughout the entire process, rather than just having tunnel vision on getting tasks done like what I did at the start of the project. Therefore, my specific action plan to follow after this project is to allow more time to get to know my team members at the start of a project rather than just jumping straight into tasks.